Five years ago, one of the world's most iconic buildings went up in flames. Tonight, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is completely engulfed by fire. Large parts of it are reduced to rubble, the roof has disappeared, the spire has collapsed inwardly. Many things are said to be irreplaceable. Great art, cultural heritage, symbols of protection and hope. What word should we use when it's all of these? The fire started at 6.30 p.m. and was eventually brought under control by brave fire crews and first responders in the early hours of the following morning. Notre Dame's spire was completely destroyed, its roof had caved in, and much of its interior was devastated. A cathedral that had stood for 850 years was left on the brink of collapse. Then the extraordinary began to happen. Out of the ashes, some of construction's most awe-inspiring teams defied the odds and worked to return this structure to its former glory. It's a remarkable story of high pressure, serious risk and painstaking craftsmanship that borders on the miraculous. This is how Notre Dame was rebuilt. Take a walk down to the Notre Dame site today and you'll encounter a hive of activity. The cathedral is set to reopen to the public in December 2024, only just missing its Olympic deadline, but restoration works will run on until 2028. Despite the pandemic, progress has been steady and scaffolding around the new spire was removed in March, revealing just some of the breathtaking work of these construction teams. This place defines Paris. Before the fire, Notre Dame welcomed more than 12 million visitors every year, massively surpassing the Eiffel Tower's 7 million and the Louvre's 8 million. The cathedral towers above this city, a masterpiece of Gothic architecture and the UNESCO World Heritage Site. But to really understand how it earns such reverence and why rebuilding it comes with such pressure, we need to give you a quick history lesson. Notre Dame was first commissioned by King Louis VII. He wanted to create a symbol of Paris's growing cultural and economic importance in the 12th century. The first brick was laid by Pope Alexander III in 1163, but it took another two centuries to complete the building. Since then, it's been the site of numerous royal weddings, the consecration of Napoleon as emperor, and the beautification of Joan of Arc. Now, one of Notre Dame's most remarkable feats of engineering are its flying buttresses. That's these arches you see here extending out the sides of the building, and they're pretty important. You see, during the 12th century, architects were getting more ambitious. They were designing taller cathedrals with larger windows, allowing for incredible interiors flooded with natural light, exactly like the ones you see here inside Notre Dame. But these taller structures meant larger, heavier walls that needed additional support. And so, the flying buttress was born. Medieval engineers connected the main walls to exterior columns with an angled beam supported by an arch. These effectively provide additional support, holding the walls up from the outside and helping to redistribute the building's weight down through additional structural elements. These buttresses were built in the 13th century when they were still a relatively new concept, which makes them all the more impressive. Unfortunately, the French Revolution saw much of the bronze, precious metals and lead stripped from the cathedral, and by the 19th century the building had fallen into disrepair. Catholicism was banned in Paris, and Notre Dame was looted and vandalised, eventually becoming a rather grand warehouse to store wine. And that was nearly it. Notre Dame had become an ancient relic that had been left to fall apart, a crumbling ruin. That was all until Victor Hugo wrote a little novel that you're all familiar with. Safe behind these windows and these parapets of stone, gazing at the people down below me. Hugo believed so intensely that Notre Dame deserved to be saved that he made it the star of his 1831 story. He dedicated a whole two chapters to describing the Gothic masterpiece, inspiring a new generation of Parisians to fall in love with the cathedral. The Commission on Historical Monuments was formed, and architect Eugène viollet le duc was brought on to rebuild the church. He replaced the spire that had been torn down with an even taller one. Notre Dame was an icon of Paris once again, the city's stoic witness to so many centuries of history. Then came the 15th of April, 2019. 
a day that left the world stunned. People watched in agony as much of the great cathedral was devastated by fire, its iconic spire lost to the ashes. There was an outpouring of grief, not just from the French, but right around the world. In the wake of the disaster, nearly a billion dollars was raised to help repair the cathedral. But alongside all the money and emotion, there was also plenty of debate about what any rebuilt Notre Dame should actually look like. Some proposed an even taller spire in the spirit of Ville le Duc, others the world's most unusual pool, or even a dramatic greenhouse. It was a time that saw countless architects join the debate about how to recontextualize this building for the 21st century. Notre Dame looked like it would evolve once again, at least for a moment. Now, obviously, when you're reconstructing something as intricate and iconic as Notre Dame, there isn't any room for error. Everything needs to be millimeter perfect. Luckily, today's video sponsor, Brilliant, is the creme de la creme of online learning. Their course on measurement can teach you the mathematics behind the Pythagorean theorem, angle axioms, and even 3D geometry. Bringing complex equations to life with visual problem-solving techniques and hands-on learning opportunities, Brilliant is focused on helping you hone your critical thinking skills, not just on memorizing formulas. But increasing your knowledge doesn't have to come at the expense of your free time, au contraire. With just a few minutes each day, you can learn more about mathematics, AI, coding, and loads more in the time it takes your morning coffee to cool down. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, scan the QR code on screen now, visit brilliant.org forward slash the B1M, or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now, let's get back to the rebuilding of that iconic cathedral. It took some time, but a consensus that the cathedral should be rebuilt as close as possible to how it was before eventually emerged from all the noise, and that view eventually prevailed. But rebuilding an 850-year-old structure in the 2020s isn't exactly easy. In fact, you'd be hard-pushed to imagine a tougher construction project than this. Teams here faced an unstable structure that's an icon of France on an island in the middle of a congested city with the eyes of the world on them and a clock that was ticking down to the Paris 2024 Olympics. There were challenges everywhere you looked. For one, you couldn't use the same stones the original building was made of because they came from quarries that no longer existed. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit, because before any of that, the building first had to be stabilised and made safe, and that process alone took two years. Those flying buttresses I mentioned earlier that were so revolutionary at the time and that helped give Notre Dame that huge soaring nave also left the structure incredibly fragile in the aftermath of the fire. If just one of them were to give way, the entire cathedral could collapse. Repairing them was a careful and painstaking process. To ensure worker safety during this time, motion sensors were installed right across the Notre Dame ruin. They would be triggered by strong winds or any movement on the ground, and sound an alarm warning people to evacuate. To hold the buttresses in place while they were strengthened and rebuilt, timber decking was placed underneath them. That decking alone had to be custom made for each of the 28 buttresses, catering to their 28 unique forms. Workers could then go inside the church and stabilize the walls from the inside using scaffolding. To keep the rain out and create a safe, dry space to work in, a large tarpaulin was placed over the areas of roof that had burned away. When the fire ignited, restoration works were already taking place at the cathedral, and several layers of scaffolding surrounded the spire. When the spire collapsed, that scaffolding became twisted and melted, a tangled web of metal that weighed almost 200 tons on its own. With the church stabilized, that molten mess had to be removed. Half of the melted scaffolding was some 90 meters high, making access a complicated task. Again, before work started, sensors were placed here to monitor for any sudden movements and keep workers safe. A secondary temporary structure made of steel beams was then built across three levels above the melted scaffolding. Specially trained technicians then used that to abseil down on ropes, getting as close to the structure as they could. They would then cut away and collect the melted pieces of metal, removing them from the cathedral. Once that was done, a huge crane would lift the rest away. With that challenging step completed, work on rebuilding the famous spire could finally begin. The stool, the part of the building the spire sits on, was built in Briary, a city in northeastern France. 
Some 40 carpenters carefully selected oak trees for the 110 pieces of the stool jigsaw, perfectly matching it with that of the original spire. They then had to assemble it in their workshops to make sure every piece would fit before disassembling it and sending it on to Paris. With the stool in place, the spire could then take shape above it, rising to a height of nearly 100 metres. Across the spire and the nave, nearly a thousand 200-year-old trees were selected from around French forests. The new spire was crowned with a golden rooster, this time reimagined as a phoenix emerging from the ashes. It's a really nice touch that was intended to symbolise the rebirth of the church, and it's filled with the names of everyone who's worked on the restoration. The church's famous stained glass windows were also left badly damaged by the fire. They had to be cleaned and even replaced in some cases. Four of the windows ended up being donated from Germany's Cologne Cathedral. Notre Dame also contained France's largest musical instrument, an 8,000-piece organ, when the fire started. It was left covered in a layer of lead dust and had to be taken apart, carefully cleaned and then reassembled. The shocking Notre Dame fire is a potent reminder that no building is eternal and that our iconic structures depend on each generation of dedicated caretakers to keep them standing, gently guiding them onto the next chapter in history. Two things have helped restore Notre Dame, the love of the French people and the extraordinary construction teams who have made miracles happen. The same two forces that rebuilt this icon in 1844 after years of lying in disrepair have now rebuilt it again in the 21st century. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. You can learn more about that at the link below. Don't forget that we're inspiring the next generation of engineers through our investment into BrickBorrow, a fantastic LEGO subscription service. You can learn more and get started today over at BrickBorrow.com. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.